In our last episode, we met USSA astronaut Commander Sophia Daguerre. Apparently, she had been in hibernation in a space station orbiting the Earth, but something went wrong, and she was jettisoned, sent back to Earth. In her mind, it's just been a few hours since she went into her hibernation pod, but in reality, it's been over 26 years. She had other crew members with her aboard the space station, and she's now concerned with their fate. But she doesn't have the technology necessary to search for them. And so she sends us to the Atlas Observatory to salvage a scanner upgrade to hopefully track down her missing crew. The Atlas Observatory is not a new location with Wastelanders. It's been there from the beginning, but it harbors a number of fascinating secrets about the pre-war American military. Upon arrival, we find that the road just outside the observatory is littered with ruined pre-war cars. There's a jeep, a delivery truck, even a stretch limo. If we take the staircase to the west, we find a door leading into the observatory. But before we head inside, let's explore out here. This entry area has a number of containers, a locked metal box, an explosives crate, and heading up some stairs, we can take out more turrets near to another door. This is the primary parking lot. We find a small road to the south connecting to the main one. Here we find a number of ruined trucks, cars, even a van, but more interestingly, we find an armored military vehicle. What is this doing? at an observatory. One would think the observatory would be for scientific pursuits, not military pursuits. From the parking lot, we can take a photograph of the beautiful Atlas Observatory sign. Atlas Observatory, Atmospheric and Astronomic Facility. Oh, so they didn't just look to the stars, they also studied the atmosphere. Against the southern wall, we find big double doors. This must be the primary entrance. Lying on the ground outside is a dismembered skeleton, and when ready, we can open the big double doors to enter the Atlas Observatory. We arrive in a concrete hallway. There's a caged-off room to the right, and a staircase to the left. Directly in front of us is a vault door. And then... <laughs> Pre-war security and communist Chinese liberator drones. What are they doing here? Is it an accident, or did the Chinese send their bots here? We'll start by picking the zero-skill-locked door to the caged-off area. Inside, we find a first-aid box on the wall, a hole in the floor, leading to a chamber below, and behind us, a security desk terminal. But then we catch the attention of a few more drones. <laughs> Accessing the terminal, Atlas, security desk. We find two entries. One is turret control. In the first memos, uh, it's blank. Let's try that again. Well, it's blank. What the heck? And it's not just me. I've read online postings from other players who have encountered the same thing. The memo section is just empty. So I guess we'll move on. We've already destroyed the turret, so moving on, we can take a look at this big vault door. What is a vault door doing in an observatory? We can't use it, we can't open it, we can't pick it. So to continue forward, we need to go down the stairs to the north. We arrive on a floor with a ramp to the east and another security door in the wall to the east. Directly behind us is a storage room with a number of shipping containers and forklifts. Turning around to the south, we find a door that leads back outside to Appalachia. This must have been the first side door that we saw upon arriving at the observatory. So to continue, we'll go east and start by hacking the skill level one locked terminal, controlling the security door. Opening the door, we arrive in a security room that can be opened from the inside using a big red button. And we see that the door is already open. Passing through the door, we arrive on a circular platform overlooking a central atrium. We'll go right for now. Continuing around the platform, we destroy more Liberator drones. This puts us into another nook to the west, which must have been a snack lounge. 
we find a refrigerator and a television, a couch against the wall. Passing some drinking fountains, we can go into a ruined restroom. All we find in here is a cooler on the ground, which strangely enough has a red scorpion egg inside. Exploring south past the break room, we find the women's bathroom to the left. There's a duffel bag in here, but it's otherwise empty. And at the very end of the southern hallway, we find a shelf and a bunch of boxes and barrels stacked beneath a staircase leading up. Scaling the staircase brings us to a mezzanine level with some double doors to the north and a staircase continuing up to the east. Opening the double doors brings us to a chemistry lab. Here we find a couple of chemistry stations and we are surrounded by consoles. In one of the consoles, we find a terminal, the prototype development terminal. Atlas prototype development. We find three options in the first research logs. Error, access denied. Backing out and into R&D, error access denied. Backing out and into corrupted, error directory corrupted. What on earth is with the terminal entries in the Atlas Observatory? Is there anything left? Directly behind us, we find a couple of bottles of Radex and a first aid kit. In the northwestern corner, we find a big blue door. Opening it leads to the telescope atrium, which lies in its own room above the atrium we came from. And inside, we find more Liberator drones. Whew, we had to go all over the telescope atrium to clear the place. Facing west, we see the big vault door we saw upon entry. Right next to it is the access control terminal. Inside, we can open the vault door. All right, so we've done a big loop right back to where we started. Let's finish exploring. Back into the telescope atrium, we see a staircase to the left and a staircase to the right. We'll go up the right one for now. This brings us to a control room with more Liberator drones. The control room is littered with Protectron charging docks and dozens of computers and consoles. But while exploring, we do find one terminal in one of these monitor banks and it's locked with a skill level three lock. This is the master control terminal. After hacking it, we find two options. We can deactivate any of the remaining connected turrets and then back out and go into system overrides. Critical system error. System recovery failed. Menu functions disabled. It's another dead end. Backing out and moving northeast, we can loot a duffel bag on the ground, some mintats on a console against a wall, and here we find the Army Data Analysis Terminal. But this one requires a key. Looks like we have to come back once we find this key. Now, there was a staircase in the back of this room, but let's explore around the telescope atrium first. Opening the door to the northeast, we pass by a number of shelves bedecked with scrap and containers. And this pathway goes all the way around, connecting to the other staircase right in front of the vault door. So that's it for level two in the telescope atrium. But there are still a few more rooms on this first level of the telescope atrium. Moving northeast, we can pick a skill level one locked tool case and move northwest into a room. This one, like the others, is filled with all sorts of monitors, buttons, and dials. Here we find the weather analysis terminal. Atlas weather analysis. Here we find four entries, instructions, archive data, pending analysis, and data input, but all of them are empty. We get the same error. System offline. I wonder if we can turn this system back on or if it connected to another system, which has long been deactivated. On the southern side of this room, we find a door back to the telescope atrium and a hole in the wall to the south. Heading through, we pass through a pipelined hallway, which ends at a nook leading back to the atrium and a staircase leading down. We'll explore the level below once we've finished exploring the telescope atrium. Against the northeastern wall in this main room, we find a red end of dungeon steamer trunk. And inside we find the scanner upgrade. We can now head back to Sophia, but first let's finish exploring the observatory. With all of the rooms on this level explored, we can scale the staircase in the middle to examine the telescope. We sadly can't peer into the telescope, and all we get for climbing to the top is an assault rifle on top of an ammo box. 
It's a beautiful little telescope. It says Atlas right on it. We can take a moment to get some snapshots and admire the large dome above us. But now we need to finish exploring the lower levels to see if we can find the key we need to open the military terminal. Hopping down, we can destroy more drones. And when done, head back to the eastern nook, this was the path with the hole in the concrete wall, and take the staircase down to the previous floor. Once we reach this floor, we find that the staircase goes even further down to a basement level. Let's explore this basement level to see if we can get the key we need. Here we find that the floor has crumbled into the basement below. Heading down, we find more drones. <laughs> This is a large circular room far beneath the telescope atrium. Here we find a bank of consoles and in one, the accelerator control terminal locked with a skill level zero lock. After hacking it, we find three entries, but just like all the others, we find that the system is offline. We find a hallway that encircles this room. It's lined with pipes and directly behind the concrete rubble ramp we use to access this room, we find a table upon which is the Atlas Utility Key. After picking a skill level one locked large toolbox by this table, we can finish exploring the room in the middle, and it's here we find a skeleton wearing a lab coat next to a red toolbox. And lying on the ground near to his remains are two holotapes. The first is the Atlas Director's password. All right, I believe now we can access that terminal. And the second is Atlas Research Log number 293. Atlas Project Research Log 29293. Uh, it's been five months. Five months since that day. They abandoned me. The military never believed in Atlas. It was just another weapon. When the nukes fell, well, what did it matter? Atlas, this research. It's been my life's work. We need Atlas. The world needs Atlas. Now more than ever. I have to finish it. Everything I need, it's, it's all here. I just need time. And hands. I've activated all the robots. They're security bots. They were never programmed for this, but it's all I've got. I can make it work. I've replaced the main lens, finished the particle analysis. I think the accelerator is finally stable. I'm so tired. But I have to keep going. Just a little more. It's almost done. Almost done. So the Atlas project was financed by the military. The military wanted to use Atlas as a weapon, but this Isaac Hammond thinks that the world needs Atlas, that it can do the world some good. And what exactly is Atlas? Now that we have the administrator passcode, perhaps we can find out. We find a staircase to the southwest that leads up to a locked door that we can open with the Atlas utility key we just found. This brings us to the large atrium directly beneath the telescope atrium. This is one we haven't fully explored yet. Instead, we kind of went straight upstairs. Turning left, we find a room lined with empty Protectron charging docks. Here, we find a bank of consoles. And lying on a table, we find another Atlas utility key. Next to this is a monitor bank with an army helmet lying on top and a robotics control terminal, which we can open using the Atlas Director's password. But all we find here is turret control. Instead of destroying them all when we arrived, we could have snuck in here to turn them off. Moving out of this room and turning left, we find another Atlas utility key lying on a cabinet against the wall. The room directly next to this is a pipelined hallway that just leads to a door leading back out to Appalachia. So back into the large room, we can continue clockwise where we find another door to the southeast. This leads to a storage room, shelves and cabinets, and against the northeastern wall, we find a skill level one lock door. After picking it, we find a supply room with a minigun. What do these scientists need with a minigun? 
On the ground, we find an ammo box and some ammunition, and some cryo mines in a blasted out safe. Back into the storage room, we find a weapons and armor workbench that we can make use of. And to the west, we find a hole in the wall, which leads to a large loading bay west of the primary chamber. Here we find shelves bedecked with crates and rubbish, a duffel bag, a skillable zero-locked metal box, and using a rubble ramp, we can leap atop some of the shelves to access an upper platform. Looking up, we see that hole in the concrete floor inside the caged off room that we saw upon entry. This was the room directly beneath it. Hopping onto the platform, we find a desk and a garbage can, and that's really it. So turning around, we can open a door to the east, which leads us back to the upper platform, encircling the large atrium. Turning left, we find an access control terminal that we can now access with the Atlas Director's password, but all this does is open the locked door at the end of the hallway. So continuing east, we can turn left into another room where we find the research database terminal, which again we can unlock with the Director's password. Here we find archives A through F, G through L, M through R, and S through Z, but all of these are empty. Error system offline. I'm beginning to think we're not going to get anything here. But I want answers. What was the Atlas program? And why did the military want to use it as a weapon? Against the western wall of this room, we find a door leading to a private office. If we're going to get any answers, it's going to be in here. In the middle of the room, we find the scientific director's terminal, which we can unlock with the director's password. Atlas, Isaac Hammond, scientific director. So the skeleton of the scientist we found in the basement is that of Isaac Hammond, the director of this facility. Inside we find three options. In the first, local drafts. Whoa, quite a few to read. System authorized to Lieutenant Commander James Oberlin. In the first report, January 24th, 2076. Lieutenant Commander James Oberlin reporting as Chief Army Scientific Advisor to the Atlas Program, replacing Major Kirk Bentley, who was deemed unfit for the role. The Atlas Program is moving slower than expected. I am here to do what I can to step it into gear. It is by my discretion that Washington will cut funding if the prototype does not yield scalable results by April. We should not continue to pay for construction of the Atlas Accelerator if the technology turns out to be incompatible. So that's why the military was here. They wanted to make sure that their investment was worth it. But what exactly were they investing in? And why was Major Kirk Bentley not suitable for the role? Why was he replaced? In the next one, report March 12th, 2076. Prototype results have yielded moderate success. Dr. Hammond has succeeded in initiating light rainfall across a significant localized area. Funding for the Atlas program will continue under the condition that Dr. Hammond invest more research into more high-energy weather conditions. I've given Atlas engineers the go-ahead to initiate construction of the accelerator while we continue to improve the underlying technology of the Atlas system. However, in an effort to light a fire under their ass, I've made it clear that funding could dry up if we encounter any more significant development delays. So the goal of the Atlas program was to create weather? And the military were happy to fund it, but only if the program was able to generate more, quote, high energy weather conditions. We immediately begin to see why the military saw this project as a unique and valuable weapon. But they were impatient. They wanted results immediately. Let's see how far along the program got in the next one, August 20th, 2076. Dr. Hammond has been able to produce a wide variety of weather conditions based on the data his team has been bringing into the lab. The latest prototype resulted in near whiteout blizzard conditions, an unusual occurrence in mid-August. Some of the local media is picking up on it, but nothing has been directed our way. Security is tight and I trust the personnel here to keep things under wraps. The automated security systems we've installed has a way of discouraging loose lips. I've got a meeting tomorrow with the top brass back in Washington to go over military application for this technology. The localized prototype won't be much use in a war, but could prove useful during small skirmishes or certain clandestine operations. And yeah, we can see how that would be useful. Summon clouds, fog, or rainfall to cover your troops as they're invading a sensitive area. Blanket terrain the opposing force has to cover with snow and ice, making it difficult. And the next one, August 17th, 2077, almost a year later. 
The Atlas project has been fully approved and funded for military applications. This could prove to be a massive asset in the war effort against China. Imagine blanketing the nation in thick black clouds until the crops die out, wiping out naval ports with typhoons, or sending fierce lightning storms against vulnerable air bases to ground air units. Heck, we could even deploy Atlas to quell any potential domestic uprisings. The sky's the limit here. It is my assessment that the Atlas system will diminish the threat of all-out nuclear war. No one would believe that a string of bad weather is under our control. More bodies are being thrown at the Atlas Accelerator so we can hasten its production. Current projections place a completion date in the first quarter of next year. They were going to use the Atlas system as a deterrent to nuclear war. They saw nuclear war looming in the distance. If the U.S. military was taking steps to prevent it, this implies that they might not be responsible for it, perhaps setting a few conspiracy theories to rest. But more disturbingly, we learned that the military was cool with using the Atlas technology against their own citizens to quell potential domestic uprisings. But even though they were pushing Isaac and the other scientists here so hard, they didn't complete it in time. Even their best estimate put completion at Q1 of 2078, which as we know was several months after the end of the world. In the next one, October 18th, 2077. Two days ago, I received a letter from my superiors in Washington. From completely out of the blue, they were shutting Atlas down. I was in total shock. I read the details and was filled with the usual bullcrap phrases like cost-cutting measures, risk assessment ratios, and taxpayer responsibilities. It also said further instructions would follow. This honestly doesn't make a bit of sense. I've decided to wait to discuss this with Dr. Hammond as I'm certain hearing the news will send him off the deep end. So wait a minute, the US military canceled a project whose goal was to prevent a nuclear war? Why? As Lieutenant Commander James Oberlin here says, it doesn't make a lick of sense. Unless the military knew that nuclear war was inevitable, that the bombs were soon to drop. But how could they know? In the final one, October 22nd, 2077, one day before the bombs dropped. As expected, I've received a follow-up letter from my commanding officer. I was to go back through all the data that Dr. Hammond collected and adjust the values and the results so that Atlas looked like a failure. Why were they burying the project that could shift the focus of the war? Why were they suddenly being so covert about the whole thing? I had a million questions, but I knew better than to call Washington and ask. Orders are orders. I just broke the news to Hammond and he instantly flew into a rage. I had to get a couple of MPs to restrain him. I thought he was going to literally kill me. Fortunately, he calmed down and then walked off the property without a word. I don't know if he'll be back or not, but I still have a job to do. Well, we know that he did come back and he stayed here even after October 23rd, 2077, after the end of the world. At last, we understand what he was trying to do. The military wanted to use the Atlas Project as a weapon to prevent nuclear war, but then canceled it a month before nuclear war actually broke out for some unknown reason that not even Lieutenant Commander Oberlin understood. To cover their own backsides, they had the scientists here fudge the data to make Atlas look like a failure. But Dr. Hammond knew that it worked. And so when the world ended, he came back. If he could get Atlas running again, maybe he could use weather to wash away some of the nuclear fallout to bring life back to the wasteland. Could the Atlas project help explain why some areas of West Virginia look relatively untouched by the war? Like the forest, for example. The forest right next to the Savage Divide where we find the Atlas Observatory. We know he stayed here for many months trying to get it to work, but he ultimately died. Perhaps he died to the communist Chinese liberator drones that invaded the Atlas Observatory, perhaps trying to find the very project that Hammond was working on to take control of it and use the project themselves, but in doing so inadvertently, killing the only scientist who could ever make it work.
Against the eastern wall of the upper level of the atrium, we find a room in which is a skillable zero lock door. This was a storage room. Inside we find a duffel bag, some ammunition, an assault rifle, and some plasma mines. This room connects to the staircase that leads all the way down to the basement. We can take the staircase back to the top level, where the telescope is, and move into the control room. Now that we have all of the passwords and keys in the Atlas Observatory, we can try to access the Army Data Analysis Terminal, but we find that we still don't have the right keys. I did a bit of sleuthing, and it turns out that the key to this terminal has not been added to the game yet. And even data mining doesn't reveal what's on this terminal. I walk away with the impression that the Atlas Observatory was designed to be used for an event, much like Arctos Pharma, but an event that they have yet to implement into the game. We found a number of those pipes in the basement that had those yellow and black hash areas that we've seen in other places around Appalachia, so perhaps the event will have something to do with repairing pipes and controlling weather inside the observatory. Maybe the system they built to control the weather in Fallout 76 proved to be too complicated, or they just couldn't get it to work, which is why this place feels unfinished. All of these terminals with data we can't read. Thankfully, though, it had enough information for us to understand what was going on here. It sounds like science fiction, but this Atlas program appears to be inspired by Operation Popeye, a military cloud seeding operation carried out by the United States Air Force in our real world during the Vietnam War. The goal of Operation Popeye was to extend the monsoon season over specific areas of the Ho Chi Minh Trail to disrupt the North Vietnamese military supply line. Operation Popeye was conducted every rainy season between 1967 and 1972. The operation was carried out by the 54th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, who flew to the skies above northern Vietnam using the slogan, Make Mud, Not War. Operation Popeye was highly classified, but the public was made aware of it in 1971 after a journalist, Jack Anderson, published a story on it. The world was pretty upset by the revelation, so much so that in 1977, the United Nations passed a resolution prohibiting any military or any other hostile force from using quote-unquote environmental modification techniques, with the goal of preventing any nation from ever trying to modify the weather in aid of warfare. The Fallout universe takes this a step farther with the ability of the Atlas program to summon snow in August. They clearly had much more success than the US military in our own universe. This entire experiment is reminiscent of the weather experiments that were going on at the X-17 meteorological station in the Big Empty, which the Courier explores during the events of Old World Blues for Fallout New Vegas. There we find a functional weather test that causes rain to fall over a model of Higgs Village. So the technology worked, which makes one wonder why the United States military would be investing in two projects that had the same goal, to be able to generate weather wherever they wanted to. And I think the answer is that the experiments going on at the Big Empty were done by a privately owned pre-war defense contractor. The scientists at the Big Empty did have contracts with the U.S. Army, which mainly provided them with defense and robot technology to help them build their robo-scorpions. But we learn from the lore of Old World Blues that the military went through many budget cuts, and one of the items on the chopping block was the research going on at the Big Empty, which is why the scientists there had to get funding from other third parties, including Frederick Sinclair, who owned the Sierra Madre Casino. So I think it's possible that the weather generation ability that we find in the ruins of the Big Empty may have been developed by the scientists at the Big Empty without the military even knowing about it, either after they stopped providing funds to the Big Empty or after the bombs dropped. Because remember, the scientists kept on doing their research after the nuclear apocalypse, since the Big Empty was shielded from much of the nuclear fallout. At any rate, with the job done, we can head back to Sophia. Nice place. I mean, I think it's nice anyway. Oh, well, you just look at this fancy thing. Not even a dent on it. Could use some soldering to fit in this old console, but... Eh, nothing I can't handle. 
In the meantime, I found some sort of emergency supplies crate that must have splintered off while the ship broke apart. Might just be a crate of space food, but maybe it's got some emergency contact codes for the satellites. Heck, it could even be my personal crate full of my Unstoppables comics that I foolishly brought with me to space. Hey, I thought I'd have time. You took comic books into space? They let me take a crate of personal items. We weren't supposed to be in deep sleep the whole time, you know. Were you able to get any data from the flight recorder? Yes, but I'm not sure how accurate the data is, or if anything has scavenged it. It's hard to tell much more until I install the upgrade module. I'll go look for your crate. Better not be some comic books. <laughs> I doubt it is. They're probably all burned up on re-entry, sadly. I had a full collection. Ugh. Anyway, I'm sure it's astronaut food or something else that the USSA thought I might need. Are you feeling any better since the crash? Ugh. The headaches emerging from deep sleep are worse than they implied it would be. I don't know. I feel sudden spikes of pain at times, and it takes a while to subside. I'm dealing with it, but it's still happening. How's the console working out for you? I know this sounds odd, but uh, not much has changed for me. Not many new consoles have been invented since the... Well, my time, I guess. The scanner upgrade has helped to compensate for the degradation that has occurred in the past years. I'm trying to modify it so I can use it for other stuff, too. Maybe hijack the scanner so I can run a holotape game? Oof, that would be good. A lot has changed since you were up in space, right? You know, it's rough. I can't put it any other way. <laughs> you know what I thought would happen when we landed? I thought there would be a parade. I thought maybe there would be a commemorative plaque. I sure as hell didn't think the world would have gone the way of the dodo. You know? We can pass a luck check of four plus to say, the way you look around here, you've been here before, haven't you? Oddly... Yes. I... I camped out here a few times while I was in graduate school with a good friend, uh, Emerson. Ugh. Oh, those were the days. We were in the same physics program at college and hit it off. It ended up not working out for us, but we remained friends. Which was good because he joined the USSA towards the end of my astronaut training. Ugh. <laughs> that would have been awkward. I'll be back later, Commander. Affirmative. Out. With that, we complete the quest one small step and begin the quest in case of emergency. Retrieve the emergency protocols. This quest sends us to Clancy Manor, but sadly, I am all out of time. We'll pick up with Sophia's story and explore Clancy Manor in my next episode. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find my designs on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon are becoming increasingly important as YouTube continues to make platform changes that make the future of YouTube monetization uncertain. So to all my YouTube members and my patrons on Patreon, you have my sincerest thanks. I couldn't do this without you. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.